healthy, but when I when I ask the, the question like uh, what is health, most people don't don't know what health is. So that's always kind of like the first part of education is to figure out what is health, where does it come from, what can interfere with that, and how can we get back if we've lost it. So most people, when you say okay, do you want to be healthy, they're going to say yes. So then I ask what is health, and usually get the crickets. So we just go look something up in, in Dorland's medical dictionary just just to see what the actual dictionary definition is. And in Dorland's medical dictionary, it says health is a state of mental, physical, and spiritual well-being or normal function. And then in Webster's dictionary, it says it's a state of normal function of all the parts of the body. So in those two definitions, there are two similarities. Okay, normal function. Those two words were in both definitions. So when we boil it down, health is a result of our body functioning at its normal, okay? So optimal health then, the best possible health, comes from optimal function, meaning our body functioning at its best, all right? So for our purposes tonight, anytime I ask a question, if you don't know the answer, it's probably function or optimal function. That's the answer, okay? So if you don't know the answer, I'll do one of these, and that just means say optimal. So, have you ever been sick? Most people have had one or many of these symptoms. So we have to differentiate what is a normal function versus what is a dysfunction. Because we've been taught some things, and when we look at this list, most of us would probably say that those are dysfunctions, right? That we're sick if we have some of these. So I want to dive into a couple of them and look at, like, running up. of dust or smoke or whatever is in the air, chances are your body's going to start producing more mucus to catch that dust so that it doesn't get further into like the, the sinuses or down into your lungs where, where it really shouldn't be. And that would be like the first line of defense, that mucus production, okay? So that's actually a normal function of a healthy individual who gets exposed to something that isn't supposed to be in there, produce more mucus. So then um, when they have a cough, Right? That would be similar in that if that stuff gets past the first line of defense and down into our lungs and it's not supposed to be there, then our body should cough. If it's functioning well, we have a mechanism that will identify something that's not supposed to be there and then get rid of it. Okay, that's what that cough does. So is a cough a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know, technically I guess if it's the body functioning, doing what it's supposed to do, trying to get rid of that stuff. My mom, when I was in high school, had uh, like a persistent annoying cough and she went to a doctor for her yearly checkup and, and the doctor checked her out and got a clean bill of health. Anything concerning me? She said, yeah, I have this, this nagging cough. And she worked in a factory warehouse where it was always dusty. So she's always exposed to that stuff, particulate in the air. So she's always coughing and clearing. And he said, oh, well, I can give you a prescription for a cough, suppressant, okay, to kill that cough. And like two weeks later, she had full-blown pneumonia. And then, because her cough was annoying, but it was constantly getting rid of that stuff that she was inhaling in the warehouse, which was probably not just dust, probably mold and a bunch of other stuff too. But that cough was doing a good job of keeping that stuff at bay. And when they cut the cough, now that the body isn't actually functioning the way it's supposed to be, did that drug just increase her function or decrease her function? It actually decreased her function. That cough was doing what it was supposed to do. So in a lot of these instances, okay, vomiting, when I was in uh, chiropractic college, we had a family reunion and uh, my grandma brought potato salad, which everybody's favorite is grandma's potato salad. And it's sitting in the hot sun for hours as the kids are running around playing in the dirt, running by and sticking their fingers in food. Grandma's potato salad, for some reason, is a good incubator for those soil bacteria that cause uh, food poisoning. And I take a big old blob and start eating it, and a few hours later I'm puking, okay? Now, is that puking a good function or a bad thing? It's, it's actually a normal, healthy function of a, a, a body that can identify that there's a poison in your system and then has a mechanism to get rid of it. What happens to those people that don't? function, don't recognize that poison in their system. They're the ones that end up in the hospital getting their stomach pumped, okay? So most of these that we're looking at, they're actually normal functions of a healthy individual, okay? But 
some of them are scary to us. Like we've been we've been programmed that if you have a fever or your kid has a fever, okay, you got to take Tylenol because Tylenol has been shown to reduce a fever, which it has. But again, you have to ask yourself what percent of the time is that fever a normal function? Okay, I'm not going to say that. Every fever is good, and that we should run, let a fever run up to 120 degrees and do nothing about it. But what percentage of your fevers are going to be that? Okay. So the uh, Harvard University uh, Medical School did a study on fevers, and this is a good number of years ago already. But they had 200 volunteers over a two-year period of time, and when you came into the facility, you filled out their intake form. If you mark that you would have a fever as one of your symptoms, they ask if you want to participate in our study. If you say yes, you're going to get one of two things. You're either going to get a placebo, which is basically a sugar pill, no intervention, or you're going to get Tylenol every four hours. Why every four hours? Because Tylenol has been shown to reduce a fever, but after four hours, what happens? That fever starts to spike back up. Okay, so um, Bob's trying to spike that fever for a reason. What? Is there a purpose, I guess, if, if I were to ask you that? Is there, does a fever have a purpose in your body? Most people say, yeah. yeah. What is it, what does it do? It kills off the... Exactly, right? It burns off most bugs, whether it's a bacteria, a parasite of some kind, or a virus. Those things are very temperature specific, which is why like, you don't find a respiratory virus in the stomach. It's the temperature difference there is, is so different. So. That fever, the body, let's say, is, is functioning at 100 percent and we get exposed to a virus. One of the one of the first lines of defense is to spike that fever to burn off that bug. And once it burns it off, then the fever breaks and that temperature comes back down. Okay. But what they found was the Tylenol group, um, they would give that person the Tylenol and it would lower the fever to a nice comfy level for about four hours, and then it would spike and then they'd give them another Tylenol and keep it at a nice comfy level for the person, but also the bug. So they found that the placebo group actually got better three to four days faster than the Tylenol group, okay? Because again, in a normal functioning person, they identify, their body will identify that that bug isn't supposed to be there, spike that fever, and then after, usually what they found was 90% uh, of the fevers broke within 24 hours, and 99% of the fevers broke within 48 hours. So usually after 24 hours or less, that fever will break and then it comes back down to a nice comfy level. But we give them Tylenol and again, it brings that fever down to that comfy level for me, but also the bug. So then the bug can reproduce and there's more of them and then the body tries to spike that fever and we give them another Tylenol, okay? So when we give them that Tylenol, did we increase their function or decrease their function? We decrease their function. Remember, health, is normal function or optimal function, okay? Sometimes it's not pleasant, but when you're puking or you've got a fever or something like that, you also have to kind of weigh the, the pros and cons of intervening there. If your body's doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's gonna be successful, in this case, much more quickly, three to four days sooner. Um, so in that 1% here, they did need intervention. Thank God they were already there and they could get it. But 99% of the time, the body's going to be successful if we did nothing with it. It's just going to burn that bug off. And three to four days, incidentally, is the amount of time that it takes the body to mount the uh, cell-mediated response, meaning generate those immune cells and then get them to that place where the infection is and then kill the infection and, you know, succeed. So, optimal health comes from optimal function, and your body's going to function 365 days a year, 24-7, right up until the day you drop, something has to control and coordinate all those functions. So there's an es estimated 50 trillion cells in the uh, adult human body. And if all of those cells were working in their own direction, doing their own thing, we, there, no coordination there, we would be a puddle on the floor. So something controls and coordinates all those different functions so that we have harmonious function in our body. What is it that controls all those functions? The brain, right? So our brain controls all the functions in the body by sending a message from up here down the spinal cord, and then out those nerves to all the parts of the body. So you got a, a nerve that carries a message from the brain out to the heart to tell us what to do and when to do it and how to do it and how fast to eat and all those good things. And you got a nerve that carries a message from the brain out to the lungs and the stomach and the liver and the spleen. Literally 
every part of your body that functions does so because a nerve carries a message for that event to happen, that function, okay? And that system is so important that it's the only system we have, okay, I've said this a million times, that's the only system we have that's completely encased in hard bone. So when we look at the central nervous system here, it's made up of the brain and spinal, uh, brain and down the spinal cord, and the brain, of course, is completely encased in hard bone in that skull, and then the spine is protected by that overlapping plate armor, I'm sorry, the spinal cord is protected by the spine, uh, that overlapping plate armor of bone. There. So this isn't just one bone. The hip bone is connected to the backbone, like the old song says, but this is 24 individual movable bones that stack on top of one another. And in between is, is the, uh, the secret to motion. In between those, each of those bones is that disc. And you guys have all heard of a slip disc, but that disc, the, the function of it is, number one, it's a cushion against gravity. Number two, it allows motion. This was a solid column of bone, we couldn't bend and twist. But number three, the thickness of that disc is what actually opens up those holes for those nerves. And when I bring somebody in, I teach them how to read the x-rays for the first time, that's one of the things that just floors people. It's like, oh, I can actually see that hole where that nerve is supposed to be coming out. I got this low back pain, I don't know where it's coming from, and I can see that that hole is closed down on that nerve, and all of a sudden it makes sense. Okay, so the thickness of that disc is important because that's what opens so that system, the, the spine there, normally, again, if everything is normal, it's doing a good job protecting those nerves, making sure that that message gets from the brain out to the body so that the body is functioning at 100%. But real world situations, those are movable parts, and movable parts can move out of place on occasion. And when it happens in the spine, it's called a subluxation, which is a fancy word for the bone's out of place, putting pressure on the nerve, okay? And technically that's what uh, chiropractors are supposed to do. They're supposed to find and fix subluxations, okay? So one millimeter of misalignment in the spine can be, it isn't always, but it can be a subluxation if it puts pressure on the nerve, okay? So one millimeter, again, about the thickness of a dime, that much space. So if we're talking about one millimeter of misalignment in the spine, um, what they found was the University of uh, uh, Colorado did this study where they looked at how much pressure on one of those nerve roots where it exits from the spine will decrease that function. And what they found was roughly the weight of a dime, so about 10 millimeters of mercury pressure will reduce that nerve's function by up to 60%, okay? so. If we got one of those subluxations here in the low back where those nerves go up to that kidney, some of you guys have seen me use this as an example, but if we've got that subluxation on day one, what percent of those messages are making it out to the kidney? 40%, right? Because we knocked 60% right off the top just with that 10 millimeters of mercury pressure on that nerve. So on day one, we might have 40% of those messages making it out to that kidney. Now, are we going to feel that necessarily? Maybe not, because are those pain-sensitive nerves? Some of them aren't, okay? So most of those nerves in the, as a whole, nervous system are functional. 90 plus percent of them are functional. So they're telling that kidney what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Then there's about 9% that carry information back to the brain from receptors in those, in those parts that are uh, pain sensitive receptors, okay? So only about 9% of those nerves as a whole are pain sensitive and the other 90% are functional. So technically we can have something like that going on and not necessarily feel it as pain, but if we leave it long enough, we'll probably see dysfunction, right? So day one, we maybe got 40%, we don't pick it up, <coughs> five years go by. Now we're down to 20%. You see, this is something that's going to get worse with time, okay? It degenerates. You guys have heard me talk about degeneration. Literally just means every generation is getting worse. So those cells that make up that kidney, they'll turn over roughly every 90 days. So if we got choke off the message going to those cells, that old generation dies off, and when the new generation comes in, it's actually getting less information. So those cells will be actually smaller and a little more damaged, okay? And every generation... So in this case, roughly every 90 days, those cells will get a little bit worse and a little bit worse.
works, that's what degeneration literally just means. Every generation is getting worse. So five years go by down to 20%, 10 years go by down to 10%, 15 years go by down to 5%. Eventually, what's going to happen to that kid is going to hit like 0% function, okay? And we'll go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I just got this kidney problem. I've always been so healthy, right? But what we haven't been, we, we haven't been healthy for like 15 years. We've been symptom free, okay? And a lack of pain or a lack of symptoms doesn't necessarily equal health because whether or not we have that pain has nothing to do with that other 90% those nerves that are functional, okay? So obviously if we have a symptom, we should probably investigate to find the cause of that. But a lot of times what happens is, like the examples that I gave earlier, is we, we look at that symptom and we say, well, we got to go for that. You know, we got a quick fix for blood pressure, like one sign of a, a kidney problem might be high blood pressure. We got a dozen pills for that. So what happens a lot of times is we'll take a pill, we'll cover up that symptom, and then the underlying cause continues to degenerate until it hits a point where it's something like this. If it's something like that, then surgery is going to be necessary because that kidney is dead in your body and it's going to be toxic and it will kill you. So we got to remove it. But jump in your little time machine and go back 15 years. A routine check of that person's spine, when I say check, again, who's supposed to be checking people for subluxations? Chiropractors are supposed to do that, but most chiropractors probably don't do that. Okay, and I'll kind of walk you through what, what most chiropractors do. They're not checking people for subluxation. We're more doing like physical therapy and massage therapy and you know nutritional therapy and all these different therapies, but they're missing the easiest part because if we have that subluxation and we adjust that subluxation, we just found that in that person and we catch it and correct it before it ever gets to this point, they keep that 100% function. It never gets to this point, okay? That's easy healthcare, that's easy prevention. So. How do you know if you have a subluxation if it doesn't always hurt? Well, the same way, how do you know if you have high blood pressure? High blood pressure you can't feel, right? Unless it's super, super high. But we get we get checked for those. There are screenings for those things. How do you know if you have high cholesterol? Again, one of those silent killers they tell us, you can't feel high cholesterol. We get checked for those things, screenings. How do you know if you have a cavity? Well, technically, you can't feel the cavity until it's like 60% of the way through the enamel of the tube. So we get checked for those things. How do you know if you have osteoporosis? Again, probably not going to feel osteoporosis unless you fall and break your hip, right? And how do you know if you have cancer? Again, one of those things that if you feel it, you're probably, it's probably too late. So we get checked for all those things. So how do we check somebody for a subluxation? Well, we do, first off, a functional test. We look at the function of those nerves, and this is there's a couple different scans that we can use in chiropractic now. EMGs, surface EMGs, will actually measure the electrical impulse going from the brain out to the muscles and organs along, along the spine there. And then a thermography scan will look at those nerves that control the blood vessels at the surface of the skin. And if we have pressure on those nerves, those nerves correlate with the ones that go deeper at that same level to the organs, okay? So in this guy's case, those nerves right there that are in the red, those are nerves that go out to the surface of the skin at the level of his lower thoracic and upper lumbar, but those are also the nerves that go to his kidneys at a deeper level. So it's kind of like that's the guy who we're talking about in that example where his kidneys aren't working the way they're supposed to. So if we see something like that where there is dysfunction, showing up on those scans, on a functional scan, then we take an x-ray and we can see how things are lined up there. And if we see that there is a misalignment there and it's putting some pressure on those nerves, that qualifies as a subluxation, okay? Just because somebody has curve in their spine, if it's not putting pressure on any nerves, that's not really the issue, okay? The body just compensates sometimes for like a short leg or something. But nerve pressure and, and interference with function plus misalignment on the spine there, that's what it takes to, to be a subluxation, be classified as a subluxation. And then who fixes subluxations? Again, chiropractors are supposed to do that. But the majority of the people that I meet that have had a bad experience with chiropractors, let's say, have never had any of this stuff done. They went to a chiropractor, and the chiropractor did what I call the flying seven, where you guys have heard me explain, they put you on your side, they grab your butt, they grab your shoulder, they wrench you out 
one way, flip you over, wrench you out the other way, put you on your face, you three cracks up the middle, put you on your back, spin your head left, spin it right, and have seven moves if you're counting, and they just manipulate every single joint in the spine, okay? That doesn't really have a corrective value. Like if that guy's T12, just that T12 is out of alignment in relationship to the one below it. If we don't grab that T12 and just that T12 and steer it directly in the, in the direction that it's supposed to go three-dimensionally, it's not going to heal back in the normal position. Okay, so a specific adjustments are specific. BJ Palmer, the guy who developed chiropractic, said chiropractic is specific or it's nothing at all. Okay, so I'm not seeing that people don't need, um, you know, general manipulations or mobilizations or physical therapy or massage therapy or any of those things. I'm just saying, I'm kind of sad that the majority of people that come in this office have had a bad experience with chiropractic because the majority of the time when they explain to me what the chiropractor did, it wasn't even chiropractic, okay? And we're getting great results with people with things like asthma and kidney problems and epilepsy and, you know, all these crazy things. And everybody always wants to know, well, what, what do you do that's different? We just check people for subluxation and do a specific adjustment. There are 200 different techniques in chiropractic we do the Gonstead system. It's just one of the specific techniques. There's dozens of other specific techniques, but most chiropractors just do a real general manipulation and a hodgepodge of physical therapy, osteopathy, massage therapy, and, and nutrition. Okay, so that's what a chiropractor. That's what technically chiropractic is. It's the detection and correction of subluxation. Okay, so I'm going to leave you guys with a quick, oops, with a quick story. <laughs> And uh, action stuff, and the story is about my very first chiropractic patient. Probably some of you guys have heard that story before. Duke, when Duke was born, remember uh, Duke was he's mom, so the the spelling is not duck. Um, but when Duke was born, he was developmentally delayed. So he, by age of 19, walked a little slower, talked a little slower, but still a sharp kid. And when he was 19, he was walking down the street in St. Paul, where he lived with his dad. And four guys in a car, supposedly it was gang related, saw Duke walking, noticed he's different, and they got out of the car and they start chasing him. Duke ran down this alley to try and get away from these guys, and they caught him down this alley, and they start beating him up. And they beat him until he's on the ground, and then they continue beating him until he stops moving. And they continue beating him until he stops breathing. And then they pick him up and they throw him in a dumpster, and they ran off, and they just left him for dead. And by some miracle of God, somebody saw this whole chase occur and they called 911. And the am uh, it, actually the police got there first and they found him in this dumpster and they got him out and they start CPR. And uh, the ambulance got there not long after and they stabilized him, okay, which meant he breathed. But he was in a coma for four months. And when he got out of that coma, it was like somebody, he, he, he was paralyzed not like waist down, neck down. It was like somebody would have stroke where everything on his left side is completely paralyzed and everything on his right side is like severe searing pain. So he has severe searing pain on one side and paralysis on his face, his arm, his leg, everything on that other side. And he woke up just screaming in agony. So they start drugging him up and they start running tests. Okay. Right now, there's only one healthcare profession that really gives a rip to, to check for subluxation. We're talking about a one to three, three millimeter misalignment, okay? So they're looking for a bleeder on the brain, they're looking for a fracture, they're looking for something gross being big because this is a pretty major issue and they don't find it. So they send them down to Mayo for a bunch of testing and they inject them with dye and they do a bunch of different tests and they don't find anything. So they send them home with morphine, which is like saying your kid's gonna die be comfortable while it happens. And he didn't die, but he went on like that for over a year, and after the first few months, his, his dad said that literally the pain just drove him out of his mind to the point where he was unresponsive, even to pain. Like, he's gone elsewhere. And he was drooling, and eyes rolled back in his head, and his dad's feeding him through a tube, okay? And a friend of his dad said, you know what, why don't you get your kid checked by a chiropractor? And he said, well, because he doesn't have neck pain, back pain, headaches, right? He's a paralyzed and he's a, he's a vegetable. And this guy said, well, but chiropractors check for something different, okay? Maybe they weren't looking for this. So 
He said, okay, I'll get it a try, but I want the cheapest clinic you can find, which was the student clinic where I worked, where they should pay people to get adjusted because they were really bad. But uh, he literally carried Duke in and laid him on the table, took his shirt off, and started telling us that story. And I'm looking at him, and he's got scars all over his body. He's withered away just like, I can't even imagine he weighed 100 pounds. And um, just skin and bone, eyes rolled back in his head, drooling. And I don't want to touch him. I'm terrified. I'm thinking, if I touch him, this kid looks like he's going to die. And if I'm the last one that touches him, who are they going to blame? They're going to come back after me. So my supervisor must have been thinking the same thing because he said, well, he's your patient, John. You... Do an analysis, adjust what you find, and just don't expect much. That's what his sage advice was. So I did an analysis, and I found pressure up there, and we did an x-ray. We took him down, and we laid him down, and opened his mouth, and held it open, and did an x-ray of those top three bones that surround the brain stem, and I found a three millimeter misalignment at that first cervical that surrounds the brain stem. And this is actually a fiber optic view of the brain stem at the first cervical. So up that way is the brain. Here's the brain stem, and coming off here, those are all nerves, okay, that are going up here and messages hit two places. And then going down that direction, that becomes the, the spinal cord, okay? And I found that subluxation. I'm a new chiropractor. I only know how to adjust that thing one way. So I gotta have him seated, but it's, it's a pain to have him seated because it takes his dad, my supervisor, and me holding him up so that I can put my thumb on that bone and adjust it, just that one bone. And I just adjusted that, that one bone and it moved great. And I was all proud of myself. That was like my first real patient adjustment. And I'm all proud, I look at his dad, his dad just goes like, like that's it, that's all you're gonna do? And I went, well, uh, you can bring him back in a couple of days and I'll check him again if you want to. And I don't speak Hmong, but I'm pretty sure he was cussing. And he picked Duke up and he walked out. And we didn't hear anything and uh, a week goes by, I'm sitting down in the student lounge reading the funny papers with my feet up on the table, and I hear my supervisor come running down the hall, and he busts into the room, and he's like, John! I'm like, what? The Duke's here, and I'm like, thank God he didn't die. He goes, you're not gonna believe this, come with me. So we run down the hall, and he opens up the door. And there's Duke sitting upright on the bench, just a big smile on his face, and there's his dad over in the corner just bawling his eyes out. And his dad said, a week from the day that he gave him that first adjustment, he woke up, literally like woke up, and he has no more pain on that side of his body, and he's actually getting strength back on that paralyzed side of his body. So they called that a chiropractic miracle, okay? And I believe in miracles, but there's no such thing. It's either a miracle or it's not. There's no qualification like it's a chiropractic miracle, right? It, it could have very well just been me praying for that kid that he didn't die. <laughs> and he could have very well done that. But we know that if you got a subluxation, putting pressure on the brain stem there, if you remove that interference, that person can't help but function better, okay? And I think it's a travesty that more people like that aren't getting checked. We're not out there at the Benton County Fair telling everybody, you should get adjusted. We're telling people you should get checked most chiropractic or most patients, even if they've been to a chiropractor before, have never had an x-ray, never had a scan, never had anybody look at their nerves, they've never actually been checked for a subluxation. That's why we open it up with people that show up here or if they're watching on Facebook or whatever, and we check those people. We do the, the food drive, we bring in a non-perishable food item, we, we do that full exam, uh, the functional exam, any necessary x-rays,